Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob, exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team, and I am joined today by my guest host, my Keynet's physical therapist assistant. And our guest today is Terry Knight. She is an expert on spinal stenosis. Very good. Joined us for the program. Welcome to the show, Terry Knight. Thank you. Uh, we're super excited to have you here. Um, could we dive right in? Mm -hmm. We could uh, find out about your backstory. No pun intended. My backstory. My no pun intended. Well. Yeah, your background. Yes. Yeah. I mean, every person with back pain has a backstory, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. My background. Um, I went to uh, Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, and I became a physical therapist over 30 years ago. Um, I have been a therapist about 34 years, I think. Um, and I've always specialized in orthopedic, even though I've done some forays into rehab and home health and other areas. Um, I worked for the Cedar sinai Spine Institute uh, for a while with spine surgeons, um, exclusively working with back pain patients and patients with stenosis and patients post-spine surgery. Um, but I really got interested in stenosis when I was still very young, like 25. I remember hearing one of my colleagues um, say to someone, oh, that guy has stenosis. There's nothing I could do for him. And it, it really stuck in my mind because, you know, when you hear that, you probably hear it over and over again. I hear therapists say that a lot. And I started um, questioning that. And when I worked for Cedar sinai I, I saw a lot of stenosis patients and I started seeing a lot of really good success. You know, the more I tried to figure out things that would work, the more I started seeing success. And also the more positive I got about stenosis, that also seemed to rub off on the patients and, and help them, you know, overcome the stigma. So uh, long story short, I've worked in the publishing industry a little bit. Um, so I just, I realized that writing a book is a way to help way more people. You can either go on the internet and become the most famous PT, or you can write a book and, and also help a lot of people with, you know, just saying it once. So, um, so that's my background. I'm, I'm now retired. I'm, I'm writing full time and, and that's where I'm at. Great. So we would like to mention your book, Rehab Your Own Spinal Stenosis, as a title. Uh, we would highly recommend it for people with spinal stenosis or healthcare professionals who work with patients that have stenosis. Would you mind telling us a little bit about the book? Sure. And look, I have a copy too. This book gets around. Oh, yeah. Very good. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. It's like on everyone's <laughs> shelves. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's right. So, uh, yeah, well, basically, I, I wrote the book because there I, I would just, and I still see so many patients who just learned that they had spinal stenosis. And oftentimes it's inadvertent. You know, someone falls off a bicycle and they get an x ray to rule out fracture, and they find out they have spinal stenosis and they think their life is over. They think they're going to wind up in a wheelchair. All these horrible things are going to happen. And, um, and then when I reassure that person, there's such a sense of relief. And I wanted, I wanted to have something out there that people could reach to, to get that sense of relief early, as soon as possible. Um, and also something that doctors could um, direct their patients to because they don't always have time to explain. Um, everything about stenosis. They just kind of dump this scary diagnosis on the patient or the patient just sees their MRI results without even talking to the doctor first. So um, yeah, I wanted to put stuff together and uh, the book is, is focused on non-surgical approaches to treating spinal stenosis. Um, it does have a chapter on surgery, but the focus is um, Let's try the, these non-surgical approaches and see how we can do. Um, that's always the best first choice. 
unless it's an emergency. Sure. It's my favorite book on stenosis without a doubt. Wow, thank you. We could tell from your book and your recommendations that you have in here that you've worked with a lot of patients who have spinal stenosis. Do you want to talk about the work you've done with them? Yes, uh, sure. I, um, I really, I look at it from uh, some, different, some different ways. I think one thing I do is I look at which I think is not unique because I know other therapists do it, but I think it's a little bit different which is uh, a lot of physical therapists look at back pain and stenosis as a structural problem. You know, the, the spinal canal is narrowed, the uh, openings for the nerves are narrowed, and we're looking at this structural problem and we need to just uh, strengthen this person so their spine is better supported. Um, and, that, and that's fine, that's good, that, that will help people. Um, I like to look at stenosis more as a physiological problem um, in the sense that we need to improve the health of the spine and the structures intrinsic to the spine. And, and the reason I look at it that way is, is circulation, blood flow, whether or not you can relax, all those things tap into inflammation and if there's any swelling, you know, any chronic inflammation, just like someone with a chronic ankle sprain might get swelling from time to time, you know, in their old ankle sprain or their old fracture, sometimes people get little flare-ups of inflammation. And if, if you can get that to a minimum and make sure that people have a good blood flow to their spine, they really have the best chance of being symptom-free. So... So yeah, my, my focus is of course strengthening, but I, I like to think about circulation and, and what's happening metabolically. Sure. So Terry, you kind of touched upon this. Um, can you tell us what you defined spinal stenosis? Yes, absolutely. That's a good place to, I should have done that right off the bat, but yes, yeah. Well, stenosis is just the, narrowing the word stenosis just means the narrowing of any opening so you can have aortic stenosis you know the, the narrowing of the blood vessel to the heart major blood vessel you can have intestinal stenosis which is awful um i like to say you can have mental stenosis <laughs> and have sort of a nar narrow-minded sometimes i can use that and people don't know what i'm talking about um but uh so, so spinal stenosis, there's actually two, there's actually four types, but there's two main types. And one is central, and that is the narrowing of the uh, spinal canal, which is basically just the opening for the spinal cord, and it, and it just drapes down the spine, like so. And that, you know, looks like that. In my book, I talk about stacking up Krispy Kreme donuts, you know, 24 Krispy Kreme donuts, and you look down the hole, down the middle, that's the spinal canal, okay? So when that space is narrowed, there's less, uh, there's less room for the spinal cord. And that can sound really scary. Like there's gonna be pressure on the spinal cord and it's gonna, I'm gonna be paralyzed. That's where people get that. Um, one thing to realize though is there is a little bit of narrowing that can happen and there's still not pressure on the spinal cord. There still aren't symptoms, okay? You can have mild stenosis, moderate stenosis, and severe stenosis. And even some people with severe stenosis don't have symptoms, which, which I think baffles a lot of, a lot of people. But it, for me, it's great because you can really be optimistic with anyone. Um, and then there's foraminal stenosis. And that's just basically, you know, you've got your spinal cord going down the spine and then uh, the nerves are coming out of the spinal cord on the side and the nerves are exiting the spine through these little exit holes. They're shaped like ears, which I like. They're shaped like little ears. And the nerves, <laughs> I always think your spine is listening, you know, but uh, it is, it's listening. So anyway, they come out, they come out the side and if those holes are narrowed, that's foraminal stenosis, all right? I, I think I'll just say a little bit more just to get it out of the way. There are many, there are uh, some different ways 
that you can develop stenosis. Different things that can cause it. I like to say different things that can take up space in the spinal canal, okay? And one of those things is bony changes, and that would be a, a lipping or spurs. Some people like to think your bone's developing calluses as you age, and then that bone builds up, and it takes up more space. Some spurs are in places where it's no big deal. It's not really bothering anything. And other times it can be in a kind of a nasty place, like right into that foramen. So bony. There's also disc. Disc herniations and protrusions can, can go into the spinal canal or the foramen. Then, then you've got things like inflammation, swelling, which people don't really think about a lot. And then um, the other thing is ligaments. You have, we have basically kind of two main ligaments inside the spinal canal. So you've got the posterior longitudinal ligament that runs down the front. People sometimes correct me. They say, why is it the posterior when it runs down the front of the spinal canal? I said, well, because it's posterior to the discs. So that's why. Just we'll clear that up so we don't get people trying to correct me <laughs> in the comment section. But uh, that one just kind of hangs down. It's like it's shaped like a kite. It's like the kite tail. And it actually attaches to the discs. And then you have the uh, ligamentum flavum in the back, which is a bunch of little small ligaments. They're shaped like moths. So I like to have people picture little moths, you know, along the back. And both of those ligaments can thicken. And obviously anything that thickens takes up more space. Uh, they can even actually calcify and, and turn bony. And that's one of the things I work with patients a lot on is in convincing them that your physiology, your circulation, your metabolism is important to maintain the elasticity of your ligaments. Um, and that is one way that you can really prevent, prevent things from progressing or turn things around. Um, you know, you see more problems with ligaments in diabetic patients, for example. So maintaining good blood sugar uh, is, is important for these people. So, uh, so I talked about ligaments, I talked about swelling, I talked about bone, disc, fascia, just connective tissue, which is this kind of cobwebby stuff that connects everything. It can either be tight or rigid, or it can be moist and elastic. Same thing, you want to keep that moist and elastic. And uh, another thing to be aware of is circulation. It doesn't really take up space, but if your circulation is poor, it makes all those other things swell, you know, thicken, become less healthy. Okay? So that, in a nutshell, uh, is kind of the anatomical definition, or the anatomical description of spinal stenosis. And it also has some um, kind of specific clinical presentations that are different from you know, maybe the usual back pain. So what are some common fears people have with spinal stenosis? People have a lot of fear. First of all, the, just the name spinal stenosis is uh, it's like a terrifying combination of, of sure. words. It just, it just sounds horrible, you know. It, it rhymes with halitosis, and <laughs> that has a negative con that has right. a negative connotation. Um, but people find out they have spinal stenosis, and they go onto the internet and they read things uh, like, you know, um, it, it, spinal stenosis is going to uh, push on your spinal cord. It's going to push on your nerves, and it, and it's going to lead to paralysis. So people come in. I mean, imagine if you thought you were going to be paralyzed. You know, you just found out you had this diagnosis. And, you, and the thing I hear most often is, and sometimes people break down and cry in my office. I'm sure you've had that happen, Bob. They say, I'm afraid I'm gonna be, I'm afraid I'm gonna wind up in a wheelchair, you know? And uh, I say, no, it's okay. You just have some mild stenosis. It's, it's quite common. Um, people are afraid they're gonna be paralyzed. People are afraid they're going to wind up in a wheelchair. People also believe that surgery is a certainty, an eventual certainty for them, which is not true, not true at all. Only five to 10% of people need back surgery. And I think that number is diminishing as we learn more and more about how to manage um, some of these diagnoses. But it is, it is not an eventuality. 
and uh, and people also think it's going to progress really rapidly sometimes so i don't have enough you know i don't have much time i've got to do you know i've got to go to italy i've got to do everything i've always wanted to because i've got spinal stenosis and i don't have much time and that's not true either it's a very it's very slowly progressive when it progresses and sometimes it does not progress and sometimes it does get better um, i'm looking at a study I love this study. It's uh, Haig, and it was in Spine magazine, 2006. 32 subjects with spinal stenosis between age 55 and 80, followed for 20 months. Follow-up showed improvements in stenosis, and six of those people showed improved uh, cross-sectional area of the spinal canal, improved. And that's like 20%. So sometimes people come onto my Facebook page when I say it can get better. They come onto my Facebook page to argue with me and be angry with me because <laughs> they think I'm giving people false hope. Oh. And it's like, well, okay. Um, so I try, I share that study and I like to share another study about discs, which shows that like 40 to 60% of herniated discs shrink over time by as much as 64%. So if your stenosis is caused by uh, disc herniation or disc protrusion, you have a very good chance of that resolving, if that even causes symptoms. Because many people have herniated discs and disc protrusions, and they don't have symptoms. And even the study I'm referring to, they found that people's disc herniations shrank, and then they looked at people, and people whose disc herniations didn't shrink still had decreased symptoms after a year. So, you know, there's a lot we don't understand about MRIs and, and imaging studies and how relevant they are to people's symptoms. But there is, is definitely hope. It is something that can improve, right? And I see, I see patient after patient improving. I'll go with this question. What are some of the signs and symptoms of spinal stenosis? Um, so some of the signs and symptoms of spinal stenosis are um, mainly um, increased symptoms with standing and walking. And especially the longer you stand or the longer you walk, the worse the symptoms get. And the kind of symptoms that you see are sometimes back pain or a sense of heaviness, but really the main symptom is, is something called neurogenic claudication, which is, uh, you know, when pain of, or numbness or tingling, it starts to radiate down the legs and the legs start to feel heavy and weak, like they're just not getting the juice that they need. And uh, another thing that happens is because when we flex forward, that kind of opens up the uh, space for the nerves and it opens up the space for the spinal canal. People will tend to, as they're walking further and further or standing longer, they'll start to flex forward. You know, they'll start to lean forward. So when you see people doing that, or you see someone flexed over a shopping cart, or if I, if I, uh, if I can uh, get up for a moment, I might be able to show this. I'm just gonna, I'm yeah. just gonna, Great. show this and yeah. I'll take my earphones off. So people, people with stenosis will be walking with a walker and they'll, they'll be walking like this and then they'll start going like this and then they'll start going like this and sure. then they'll sit and kind of yeah. going like that. No, when I see great. people like that, I think stenosis, it's not always stenosis, some other things like Alzheimer's can, can have people walking like that. But another main indicator of stenosis, lumbar stenosis, is that symptoms are relieved by sitting. And it, it happens really fast. It happens just like that. You know, so people can have weakness in their legs or pain down their legs. But if they go away when you sit, that is a sign of stenosis, all right? Another, another thing is um, often people with back pain, they, they, it's uncomfortable to sneeze. They kind of brace and they grab stuff. It's really painful to sneeze or cough. But with stenosis, it's really not painful to sneeze or cough, okay? Um, people with stenosis have an easier time walking uphill than downhill. 
And that's because when we walk uphill, we bend forward a little bit. When we walk downhill, we can lean back a little bit. Another uh, sign of stenosis can be uh, pain is not increased by bending. But pain or symptoms are increased by extending, looking up, sometimes forcing people upright will aggravate their symptoms. So something, I'll say this one thing, something I see a lot um, sometimes in uh, clinics or home health is I'll sometimes see a therapist, there'll be a patient uh, walking a, a bit stooped over and I'll see the therapist uh, shoving them up, you know, yeah. get stand up straight and forcing them up. And that's really not a good idea. Um, people with stenosis will stand up as straight as they are comfortable. And if they need to bend forward a little bit, it, it's okay to let them. Um, what I do is I keep working on strengthening, exercising, working to improve the health of the spine. And gradually, as people feel comfortable, as their symptoms decrease, they will start to stand more erect, okay? But we also have to remember that as people age, their spines change shape, their bones change shape. So the bones in the thoracic spine can become a little bit more wedge-shaped instead of uh, cuboid-shaped. And so there's some natural curvature, some natural kyphosis that, that can happen as certain people age, and we need not to be so rigid with those people, okay? Now, sorry, Mike, I'll take your next question. Well, we, well again, um, this is more of a older people's disease, right? Well, uh, yes and no. Um, yes, because at least 50, at least 50% 50 of people over 60 have some degree of stenosis on imaging. Wow. That's, that's discovered. Maybe only 20% of those people actually have symptoms, but it's very common as we age. And it's even, you know, it's even more prevalent in your 80s and 90s. It's just a natural part of aging, especially with all the bony changes that occur as we age and so on and so forth. But I don't, I don't want to leave out that some people are born um, with narrow, narrow spinal canals. Some people are born with narrower spinal canals. And so I do mm -hmm. hear a lot from younger people who have uh, what's called congenital spinal stenosis. And, uh, and I, I try to give them the same advice that it can improve and that they can work on it. But those of us who are born, uh, uh, there's one doctor, his name is, uh, his name is David Hanscom. And I was reading his book and one of the lines in his book is, some people are born with huge spinal canals. And, uh, and I was just thinking, I hope uh -huh. I'm one of them, you know, I, I don't know how uh, huge, right. but, you know, Me. if you have a huge spinal canal, you can, you can have disc bulges and all kinds of things going on and, and never have symptoms. Um, but some right. people are unlucky and have, have smaller ones. And some spinal canals are shaped uh, oval and, and some are, are shaped like this. They're called tree, trefoil. They're good little triangular shape. So the triangular shape is not quite as fun as that shape. So there's lots of variation, but yes, stenosis is a normal part of aging and it is not highly correlated with symptoms. It's not, it's many people have stenosis and don't know it when they just, when they just do MRIs and x-rays of the general population without pain, many people have stenosis. It is not guaranteed that you're going to have symptoms when you have stenosis. Okay. If you have a, an appendicitis, there's a very high likelihood that you will need to have surgery. You are going to have symptoms, okay? Stenosis is not like an appendicitis. It's a natural part of aging. Um, I have some stenosis in my spine. I, I currently have no symptoms whatsoever. I can do whatever I want. And, uh, you know, I've suffered with back pain in the past, but uh, right now I feel great. And uh, Bob, I just want to say one more thing about aging because I just learned this this year. And I, I put this study, oh, here it is. Sorry, I like, I like to refer to things so I quote them properly. But uh, 
people always have this idea, right? Of and and I've I've seen young people make fun of older people, like, oh my aching back, you know. But did you know that back pain complaints decrease as we age? Yeah, actually, Dr. Stuart McGill told me that. Yeah, I mean, it's great. People complain about back pain uh, in their 30s and 40s, and then it starts to decline right. as we age. And I think as, you know, I'm an older person, I'm almost <laughs> 60. I think we older people need to take back you need to take back the, right. uh, you know, we could, I'm going to start making fun of some younger people. I go, <laughs> oh, I'm a young person, not back pain. You know, I'm just going right. to, I'm going to switch it around, right? <laughs> but, um, but that's something, again, like when people find out they have stenosis or degenerative disease, they think about aging, they think about their mortality, they think it's going to get worse. And I would say, no, the chances are it's going to get better with age. And uh, the other thing with the aging is um, sometimes, yeah, this happens to young people, happens to middle-aged people. Doctors will scare people by saying, um, you have the spine of a 70-year-old, yeah. right? You have the jaw. I had a woman who went to the dentist and uh, she had her mouth open for three hours. And then the next day she couldn't open her mouth. So they, they took an MRI. They said, oh, you have the jaw of an 80-year-old. And I said, my dear, just, and she was terrified. I said, my dear, just go to the nearest nursing home and, and watch at lunchtime and watch the eight year olds eat. You're going to be okay. They, they eat, they talk, they laugh. And I said, you had the same job an 80 year old before you went to the dentist and you did all those things and you were fine. So, you know, a lot of our job as physical therapists is just using logic to pull people out of fear. Right? Absolutely. So in treating spinal stenosis, what are your three areas of focus? Well, I actually, I have three areas of focus in the book, but I'm going right. to add a fourth area today, Great. Um, which is it's kind of woven through the book. But my, my number one area, and this is just because of the latest, you know, research has come out in the last two or three years where they, where they take people, um, and they only treat their fear. They only treat their emotions or their brain or their nervous system. And there, there's one study uh, in the uh, Journal of America, American Medical Association Psychiatry where they, where they took 50 people and all they did was do uh, pain education. And they had like 98% of them got better. 73 wow. completely resolved. I'll send you that study later if, you yeah. have, if you're not aware of it. 45% of those people had spinal stenosis. Um, so my first approach, and I think my number one approach, is to dispel fear. To take, to help the person get rid of their fear. And also to help the person manage their stress and make sure that they've, they've not got like some underlying emotions that are making them guard and tense or revving up their nervous system so that they're, they're, you know, they feel a little bit of pain and it, and it gets accentuated by the stress. So I work with people on that first. Then I go into the approaches that are in my book, um, which is uh, number one, um, decreasing inflammation, right? So not everyone with stenosis has inflammation, but uh, there are some signs like um, constant pain, constant severe pain, Pain when you turn in bed, you know, pain with just little movements, pain with sneeze or cough. Um, not guaranteed that there's inflammation, but I still, we still try to treat the inflammation first. And we do that with positioning, ice, um, exercises, teaching people to take breaks, teaching people how to use their bodies in a safe way, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and then gradually starting to reintroduce activities. And we kind of cut out all the activities that can aggravate stenosis typically, like extension. You know, I don't let people go fishing and haul back and throw that reel. I advise people not to help their friends move their sofa or refrigerator down a flight of stairs, which, which has happened before. Um, so I get people to kind of calm down the inflama any inflammation that may be present. And, uh, and then the next area I like to call strategic exercise. And the only reason I call it strategic is that you can be strategic in terms of spinal stenosis. 
you know. So people with spinal stenosis are, they, they complain to me a lot about this. My doctor told me to walk for exercise and walking aggravates my symptoms. And so I'm stuck, I'll never get better. And so, hey, there's lots of ways you can exercise. Um, there's lots of ways that you can get aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise improves circulation. So I try to get them doing what the American Heart Association recommends, which is 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week. Um, but I've also started introducing with people some uh, high intensity interval training, which is kind of a sneaky way to improve your cardiovascular health without having to work out 150 minutes per week. Um, but also with stenosis, getting people to do stuff in a position of comfort aerobically works. So riding an exercise bike instead of walking. Um, a recumbent bike. I've talked about the new step. I've also talked about people go out and, and they, they overwalk. You know, they're like, I, I will walk myself better. And they walk and walk until they fall down or they walk and walk until they make themselves worse. And I tell people, just walk as far as you're comfortable, take a break and then walk back, try to increase your distance. Um, walk as fast as you can and then take a break, walk on a treadmill. Um, sometimes people can get their aerobic exercise in the pool. Sometimes, uh, you know, if they're very deconditioned, they can just sit in a recliner and with a little foot peddler in front of their feet and they can start there. So you have to not give up on aerobic exercise. You have to find something that's going to work for you. So I strategize with them on that. And then I also look at uh, muscle tightness, um, especially the hip flexors. I feel like the hip flexors get tight a lot because people are flexing all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some studies out there that are saying hip flexor length doesn't, doesn't mean that much. It's not that relevant toward back pain, but uh, I'm going to disagree when it comes to stenosis just because of the postural deformity that people are stuck in. If they start to feel better and they want to straighten up, maybe they can't because their hip flexors are still too tight. So I try to help them with stretching hip flexors, glutes, any, any muscle that might be tight. And I try to help them do it in a way where, because a lot of people, when they stretch, you know, even when you pull your knee up to your chest, and, and that can sometimes feel good because it flexes the spine. But if you, if you put a towel roll, and this is in one of my videos on YouTube, if you put a towel roll in the Lordotic, in the Lordotic region, uh, which is just the small of the back for the lay people, all right? Yeah. You put a towel roll there and then you, and you make sure that back stays arched while you pull your knee to your chest. You're gonna feel it completely differently and you're gonna feel it in your glutes instead of in your spine. And uh, so I do some things like that. And then the other strategy I use is uh, mobilizing the thoracic spine or any of the joints above and below the stenosis so that uh, that freedom of movement is there. And that's just kind of common sense. If, if I twist and I'm, you know, a lot of people are so stiff. Some, some people move like a robot, you know, they get a diagnosis and they think, I'm, I'm just gonna stay in this plane here. They, and they lose even more motion. But in order for your spine to be healthy, you want, you, know, you want everything to move, including your hips, as you're doing some of these activities. Um, so I help them with that. I give them exercises for that. And then I manually help them with that. And uh, I can't really go too much into that. But I think every physical therapist yeah. has ways that they could do that. And then the last Come section, on. sorry if I have this going on no, too long. The last section no. is just overall health and wellness, um, you know, which involves diet, smoking, sleep, psychology, everything you can think of to improve your overall health. Because uh, one big factor in recovery from spine surgery and being asymptomatic is lack of comorbidities. So you want to be as healthy as possible. Uh, going back to the anti-inflammatory strategies, um, could you talk in maybe great, greater detail on the first five? Um, the first five that I have listed in my book, um, I think uh, the first one is just find 
your best resting positions. Right. And, and that, you know, that involves some education on, uh, you know, reminding people that extension bending backwards can sometimes be aggravating. And also just that very large, large twisting motions can sometimes be aggravating, especially with foraminal stenosis. Um, but I, you know, I teach people just the basics, which is uh, people generally feel a little more comfortable lying on their side, not always. But if you're on your side, you can put a pillow between your knees or you can put a pillow in front of your chest. Some people put a pillow behind them. So they're just completely propped in this in this very um, loosely packed, very comfortable position. If you're lying on your back, sometimes I have people put a couple pillows under their knees. And I'm a big fan of body pillows because you can throw those things everywhere and just get support all over. Um, as you're finding your best resting positions, I also want to make sure it's clear. I don't tell people to just rest all the time. I want them sure. to find a resting position, you know, two or three times a day for 15 minutes or a half hour or a short period of time so that they get in the habit of giving themselves a little break. And then while they're resting, they can work on breathing exercises, relaxation, reassuring themselves, all kinds of other things that reduce inflammation. Um, the next uh, technique I like is ice. Now, we know that both ice and heat are helpful for inflammation. I have a bias towards ice. And the reason I'm biased toward it, some people can't use it. So if you can't use it, you can't use it. Some people are actually allergic to ice. They have a very bad response to it. But if you can, I like it because not only does it reduce inflammation and swelling, but it slows down the nerve's ability to transmit pain signals. So when people are inflamed and they're in constant pain, their brain is getting a constant signal. And, um, you know, after a certain amount of time, that, that pain becomes imprinted on the brain. So even if we're not getting that signal, we'll still feel it. So it's really important to me to interrupt that signal and to give people multiple interruptions throughout the day. So ice for 10 minutes, very cold, try to get it numb. And then I always try to give people a visualization, like imagine your back is on fire and the ice is putting the fire out. And that I think helps um, accomplish the relaxation that goes with it. I actually thought, I've actually been thinking, cause I've used ice a lot and people come to me, I didn't think it would work. I say, you have to use it. You have to use it two to three times a day for five days before you give up. And after five days they come back and I go, I never believed you, but it worked. And I did the visualization. And now I'm thinking, hmm, was it the ice or was it the visualization? <laughs> I don't know. I like to think both. But anyway, that's how I like to use ice. And there are instructions in my book on how to use it safely. I do recommend that people make sure that they're using it safely and consult with their uh, medical practitioner for that. Okay. Um, the next one uh, that I have in my book is using a lumbar corset. And I have that in there. Um, I think it's the North American Spine Institute uh, did a report on um, stenosis in 2011. They, and they, you know, they looked at all the available studies at the time, and there was a study that was uh, significant and of good quality that showed um, that people could walk farther when they wore a lumbar corset than without some people with stenosis. And that's really the only reason I put that in there, because if people are going to go for a long walk and they want to get more exercise, they may be able to do it with a corset or somebody, you know, you want to do dishes or you have to go to some big event, you want to get through it. It may be more easy with a corset. Um, the other thing is for sleeping. I like corsets for sleeping because it kind of prevents people. Sometimes they twist suddenly. It just kind of prevents, uh, it just kind of, stabilizes that area. So when you're twisting, you use your upper back or you use something else and maybe you get a better night's sleep because of that, okay? And that helps with the inflammation. I don't recommend corset wearing 24 seven or becoming dependent on it. No. Um, that's not what it's for. And so I always tell people, don't wear it more than a half hour at a time during the day. And the only time you wear it all the time is you can wear it to sleep. So. We use a corset as a tool, works for some, doesn't work for others. Number four, um, 
Number four is use a walker. And um, of course, if you don't need a walker, if, if you don't have many symptoms and you're not having trouble with balance, you don't need to use a walker. But if you're walking and you're starting to stoop, 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 or you're limping, you know, egregiously limping around, um, just using a walker can just keep you in better alignment, take a little pressure off the spine. Just because you use a walker for three or four days, maybe during a flare up, doesn't mean you have to stay on the walker for the rest of your life. A lot of people think a walker is gonna make them weak or that the moment they put their hands on the walker, it's all downhill from there, their life is over. Um, I hurt my back when I was 25. I used a walker for two weeks uh, because my gait was smoother with it. I knew that I was w walking more in a more healthy way as I used it, and then I got rid of it when I was done. Um, so I, anyone can use a walker during a flare-up um, with the caveat that uh, you don't have to get dependent on it. And if you, know, if you don't really have problems with balance uh, and you're using it you know, for more than a week, um, you might wanna get some help weaning yourself off of it, okay? But uh, for older people or people with balance issues that are severe, I can tell you this, um, it is much better not to fall than to fall, okay? Yep, absolutely. Um, when you when you fall, you can you know you can spend time in the hospital, and that causes your health to deteriorate much more than using a walker and not falling. Right. And then the other advantage to a walker is if if you can't tolerate walking very far, you can use a walker. Or you can use a four wheel walker with a seat to get out and take long walks, and you can sit down whenever you want and take a rest. And so a walker can actually be a way to get more aerobic exercise. And uh, number five is just uh, teaching people how to avoid aggravating activities. And that's really an a experiment for each person to figure out which activities aggravate them. I have some lists in my book, um, but you know, heavy lifting, um, jumping out of a plane, things like that, certain things to avoid <laughs> that you're not gonna aggravate yourself. And, and then I show some ways, you know, how to do dishes in a way where you, where you use your whole body instead of just one little segment over and over again. And, and these things can help calm down uh, the pain and discomfort to, to get you to a point where you can actually start reintroducing them and um, doing more as you get more fit. Um, Terry, you emphasize the importance of keeping moving. Could you please yes. talk about that? Yes. Um, well, uh, Actually, uh, when, you, when you keep moving, you know, if, if, well, there's a lot of studies on bed rest, you know, where people just lie in bed when their back hurts. Right. And all those studies show that when we just lie in bed, uh, back pain gets worse. We just get weaker and weaker and it gets worse. Um, but there's also evidence that uh, not exercising um, increases inflammation because when we exercise, certain molecules are released that um, decrease inflammation. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Oh, I, I shouldn't exercise or move because I'm gonna stir things up. But exercising and moving will actually reduce swelling and inflammation. And also you're, you'll get endorphins, so you get natural pain relief. Um, if, if you're, sorry, if your exercise is swimming, um, I found out recently that swimming um, causes a release of serotonin, which is like more than any other exercise. So um, if there's any history of depression or, uh, you know, if you, you want to have mood elevation, swimming is a great exercise for that. And, and serotonin is, is like a very relaxing um, hormone. So um, yes, you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep strong. If you don't move, you can get weak, you can get atrophy, and it becomes even harder to move, and you get stuck in this loop where it's more painful to move. Um, it's just something you have to do. Um, I do recommend if you're going to move and you have a fear of movement, okay, there's something called kinesiophobia that happens to a lot of patients. They're afraid to move, and that's that. Sometimes physical therapists cause it because they teach people something called abdominal bracing. 
I have this thing about abdominal bracing. It drives me crazy because I see people walking around with their abs pulled in and they're walking around like these robots because they're bracing everything. Uh -huh. And really, we need, we need to learn to actually relax a little bit as we move. If your abdominals are at normal strength and your muscles are at normal strength, you should be able to move. And moving actually while you breathe and, and taking breaths while you move. I, I advise a lot of people to do Tai Chi or Qigong because you learn to coordinate breathing with your movements and it helps you to relax just as you move throughout the day. So uh, that that's, yes, I try to really tell people not to stay in bed, not to stay stuck in the recliner, get right. up frequently throughout the day, yes. So um, beside, um, having the exercises in your book, you also have um, at your website um, rehabspinalstenosis.com, right? That's right, rehabspinalstenosis.com. Every exercise that's in the book is uh, shown on video on the website. Great. Fantastic. There's like a little button. Yeah, there's a little button that you click that says watch videos. And then it's some of the videos kind of talk about generally stretching, but then every single exercise in the book uh, is shown on video. Oh. Uh, with the audio book, I have, when the audio book comes out, I'm also going to put the diagrams up on the on the internet for people as well. Where is that going to be available? The audio book. Uh, my audio book. I just finished recording my audio book this week. Yesterday, actually, it was fantastic. Congrats. Thank you. Um, I, I always thought I had an old lady voice, but I found out no, you sound great. that I sound like a little girl, so. <laughs> <laughs> which is good. I'll take it. Um, but yes, it, uh, uh, the book will be available on Audible uh, August 31st. Audible. Okay. Yeah, Audible. Yes. In your book, you also expect, uh, said to expect flare-ups. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? And what should one do during a back pain flare-up? Well, there's, there's two reasons why people should expect flare-ups. First of all, they, they happen, okay? So sure. if uh, any time uh, something that's bound to happen is a surprise, that always makes the severity of it worse. Or, or because it, Agreed. A lot of, again, it can generate fear. Well, I was feeling fine. And now I went all the way back to square one. Or sometimes my patients will say, I went out and I did this and I had so much fun, but then I paid for it. You know, people always think they're paying for their, for their enjoyment. And I say, um, no, you're not, you're not paying for it and you don't have to pay for it. And you just had a little flare up. Sometimes that flare up is caused by inflammation or some little strain. But you know, some people exercise really hard, or they, they work out, and then they have some muscle soreness, and it feels a little bit like pain, and that puts them in a state of fear, and that part of your brain that's memorized the pain that you had before, it recreates the whole thing, and it, it, you know, it cycles through. So that can, people can have like flare-ups that are related to their fear and their nervous system. And then there's just a regular old flare up where maybe you did something repetitive or you did a little bit more than you should and there's a little bit of inflammation, but we don't have to panic because we have tools. We have our anti-inflammatory tools. Okay, I have a flare up. One, I'm not going to panic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna recognize that flare ups are common and that I have control over this. I'm gonna use some eyes. I'm gonna get into a resting position. I'm gonna tone things, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pamper myself and I'm going to keep moving. I'm not going to worry. And uh, yes, yeah, so in that way, I want people to expect it. And, um, and I also want people to look when they have a flare up, is there something going on in their lives that is stressful? Is your mother-in-law, is your mother-in-law arriving in two <laughs> days? You know, are you, are you about to become a father for the first time? It's amazing what people tell me. These huge events are happening at the same time as the flare up. So sure. I often advise people to do something called expressive writing. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, I'm not. Um, but it's, it's, I start again, something I've started using this, this year with people. Um, but basically I have patients sit down 
and they write about something that's bothering them, either their worst trauma or something that's going in their lives right now. And they write, they write for 15 minutes, they do not censor. So if they're angry, they can do whatever they want. You know, they scream, hit, whatever. They write for 15 minutes. I know it sounds a little woo woo, but they write for 15 <laughs> minutes and, and they shred it and they do it for four consecutive days. And I have used this with a lot of patients and I've only had to see them one or two times because everything clears up. And they're like, oh, I, I thought I was upset about that, but I really didn't realize how upset I was about that. And uh, just to explain expressive writing so I don't sound too much like a, like a hippie or woo-woo person, <laughs> it's based on a study. Sure. It's based on a study where they took college students and they had half of them write uh, whatever came, write whatever comes to your mind for 15 minutes, four consecutive days. And they had the other half write uh, about their worst trauma for four consecutive days. And then they followed them for a couple of years. And the ones that wrote about their, their trauma or something that was upsetting to them, um, they have 50% fewer visits to student health. And they scored higher on memory tests. And they have multiple people came back and thanked the, uh, the researchers because it changed their life, you know. And the other ones, they were ungrateful and <laughs> you know, sick all the time and so on and so forth. Sure. But they've done a lot more experiments with expressive writing and back pain. And uh, it's something that works. Um, we know that stress I've, affects I've back pain. I've heard it called... It's an uh, easy tool. Yeah. I, I think I've heard it called journaling. Uh, yeah, journal... I, yeah, I don't know if uh, yeah, the same thing. It might be not? called journaling, but I, but this way you really have to focus on something that you're upset gotcha. about. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Bob, men write journals and girls write diaries. Yeah. So okay, that's gotcha. right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my yeah. my diary Thanks has a little gold key. Mike. <laughs> when I write my anger down, I use a little gold yeah. key to lock it up. Understood. <laughs> Did we get through everything, I think? Uh, yeah, this is the last question, Mike. Did we get sure. through everything? Yeah, yeah, we got one. One more one question. One question, here. a long sure. one. So, at the end of your book, you include 25 tips for lumbar spinal stenosis. Could you briefly mention 15 of your favorite tips? Could I briefly mention 15? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe five, thanks, three? Thanks for that know. question. Yeah, you can do last. No. You can. No, it's laugh. okay. I'm just going to riff. I thought they I'm, were good I'm, tips. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to riff. So, right, uh, right. Sounds uh, good. Number one, don't force yourself to stand up straight if it's not comfortable. Very good. Okay? Don't let anybody else force you to stand up straight if it's not comfortable. Yeah. Hey, get a hot tub. Why not? <laughs> Do Tai Chi or Qi Gong. Yeah. Do breathing exercises. Try expressive writing. There's a book called Expressive Writing. You could try it. Number f number seven, find as much evidence as you can that stenosis is common and normal part of aging. Okay, find evidence to reassure yourself. Um, eight, get regular aerobic exercise or do high intensity interval training. Try aquatic exercise. Maybe see a Feldenkrais therapist. Maybe see a psychologist specializing in neuroplastic pain. Don't panic. Don't have surgery if all you have is central low back pain because surgery is not, doesn't have a good track record for taking care of people with just back pain. Okay. Quit smoking. Keep moving. Don't be afraid to move. And know what your red flags are that would send you to the emergency room. Those are my Fant tips. Fantastic. See, that was fast. Mike, you want to mention her book? Almost like I was again? prepared. <laughs> yeah, very good. So again, for those listening or watching, your book is Rehab Your Own Spinal Stenosis. Uh, I'm assuming it's available on your website and probably Amazon as well? Absolutely. It's not available on my website. It's available on Amazon. Oh, yeah. okay. If you go to my website, it'll just take you to Amazon. Could oh. You, Terry, could you mention your, your website again? My website is rehabspinalstenosis.com. And your audio book is coming out when and where? August August 31st on Audible. Fantastic. Really great stuff today. Excellent. Um, so glad you could join us and I uh, hope you have a great 
back healthy day. Thank you. You too. You too. Think of any puns for that, could no, you? I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> no.